This is the second in an ongoing series designed to introduce to those interested some of the little-known lore of the 19th century Lower Mississippi Valley South, particularly those writings that involve pioneer ways, including the hunting of the black bear and other big game of that time and place. One of the jewels from that era is the obscure autobiographical piece by Andrew Jackson Paxton, simply entitled Reminiscences. Paxton, known to his friends as Jack, and his wife, Hannah, settled around the present-day Arcola, Mississippi, in Washington County in the 1840s. If you find this project worthwhile, please like it, share it, and subscribe. And please do visit the website and Facebook page cited in the notes below. That said, I begin. How and Why I Came to Deer Creek by Andrew Jackson Paxton I was born on the 18th day of March, A.D. 1816, in Rockbridge County, Virginia. Aunt Betty said that she was born in Tennessee, but she didn't know. She was found in the Warren County Hills when all were covered with cane, where the bear, undisturbed, fattened on the beech nut. It is safe to say she was not made. Like Topsy, she just growed. At 16, she was a beautiful girl. Her cheeks rivaled the sunny side of a ripening peach. She was wooed and wedded by Joel Cameron, a lawyer of Vicksburg, who owned a large estate four miles north of Vicksburg known as Walnut Hill Plantation, fronting on Long Lake, where it was fought and won the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou by the gallant General Stephen D. Lee. She had but little benefit of schools in early life, but was educated in polite society. Illiteracy would, however, sometime crop out. Joel Cameron was soon murdered by his slaves. The body sunk in Long Lake. One of the murderers was convicted and hung. After a time, Mrs. Cameron was wooed and married by Alexander Gallatin McNutt, a member of the state senate and the author's maternal uncle. The wedding, which took place in 1833, could only have been gotten up in Vicksburg, where everybody was rich. The flow of wine, the revel of the dance, were only checked by the rising sun. I first saw her when she was taken to Virginia by McNutt to be seen by his kinfolks. She was cordially received, entertained, and ever remembered. She was then a beautiful woman. I arrived in Vicksburg around the 12th of October, 1837. McNutt was inaugurated as governor of Mississippi in January, 1838. I went with them to Jackson and was irregularly a member of the family until 1850. I was in a large class examined to practice law for the High Court of Errors and Appeals in January, 1838. Some were rejected. The last question asked me by Judge Sharkey was my age. My answer was 21 last March. I was educated a lawyer. I never loved the practice of the law. I loved the green woods, the wild, unbroken forests, the chase of large game. Residing at Jackson and Vicksburg, whenever I had a week of leisure, I went to my brother's place, west of the Yazoo, near the present railroad crossing. I hunted ducks and deer and killed some bear. There were no levees on the Mississippi. We had then not only the early spring, but the June rise. I was there in June 1844. The place was overflowed, the water about a foot deep in the yard. I took a number of men to Sky Lake to examine the lands of my brother in that vicinity. I found them high. The swamp was not full, but just now filling. With my compass, I ran some lines. When I stopped to make my notes, it took two men, one on each side, to keep the mosquitoes off so that I could write. In wandering about, I found in a break a mother coon with her cubs. I tried to shoot, but before I could level the barrel, it was so covered and the sights filled with mosquitoes, I dropped the gun and charged with the stick. 
Her attention being diverted by the mosquitoes, I took her by surprise and conquered. I had heard of mosquitoes being bad here and there. Now they were bad there, and I was there. I did not stay long. I returned to the old place, went up the creek for twenty miles, but all was water. My brother lost heavily on that plantation. In 1846, I had $6,000, my earnings at the law. The field notes in the Surveyor General's office told me that the banks of Deer Creek at the crossing of the south boundary of Township 17 were 15 feet above overflow. So I bought all of Section 36 and the large part of Section 25. In the fall of 1847, Jim Collier was employed as overseer for the prospective Deer Creek plantations. We went on a boat at Vicksburg, taking with us men, mules, and a general plantation outfit, not forgetting the dogs. We landed at the bars in Griffin Place in Shirttail Bend, now known as Lake Lee, and took the trail made by William E. Smith a year before on the north boundary of Township 16, and landed at the southeast corner of the southwest fourth of Section 36, Township 17, Range 7 West, where Arcola now stands. Now I was in a country just to my notion. The body of standing cane was three miles wide and thirty miles long. Except in the little clearing made by Smith, the cane break was unbroken. The waters were alive with fish. There were many roads leading in all directions. They were made by and belonged to the bear. We cut a road for ourselves and went up the right bank of the creek to where Bill Williams now lives and struck our tents. That is, we set a ridge pole and stacked cane against it. In front of our camp there was on the east side a patch of dead cane. We moved over, soon disposed of the dead cane, and were ready to build. We had on the ground for building material a box elder grove. We cut the logs about 15 feet long, split them in halves, and commenced building. Reverend Collier sat on a corner, notched it up, and carefully divided the twist. We soon had some houses and were at home. Sunday morning, a man came in and reported a bear in the opening about 20 yards above. We went up with our rifles and many curves. As soon as our dogs reached the ground, they raised a yell and the bear ran up a tree. He stood on a horizontal limb. As Jim Collier had had no experience, I told him to shoot first. He fired and missed. I fired. The bear held for a minute by his forefeet, struck the ground with a thump, and was dead. This was a surprise all around. The dogs had never seen a bear, and the bear had never seen a dog. Jim Collier missed the mark even after his rifle ball centered the bull's eye. But I was newly married. The bride of three weeks had, with her own hands, cut and made me a new suit of Kentucky jeans. I must go and see Hannah. As I passed through Vicksburg, I interviewed Joe Woodson, the father of Ed, now on the place and body servant of my brother Alex. The instructions to Joe were that hereafter, when you see me coming to Vicksburg, drop all other engagements and go to stealing dogs. When you see me go aboard the boat, you come with your captives. So I, from time to time, replenished my stick. Now I would not take a morning boat, for that would put me off in the night, so the later in the evening the better. I would then get my breakfast on board and make my way to Deer Creek. At other times, I would borrow a mule. Sometimes I would bring a plantation horse with me. But to Deer Creek was a hard road to travel. The road was wide enough for a wagon to pass, but the mud was bottomless. I often had to swim the bios. On one occasion, when one of my neighbors from 15 miles below came to visit me, they came up through the open swamp and were belated when the mule of the leader bogged out of sight. He hailed the rear. Come on, boys, I have found the road. Once I stopped in Vicksburg, went into Sparks' stable, and inquired, Have you anything that will carry me to Deer Creek? 
He said, yes, and brought out a good-sized pony horse, saddled and bridled. That was Bob Waterman. I bought the outfit for fifteen dollars. Hannah soon captured him. He was a lady's horse indeed, as easy going as the cradle of a sucking babe. But Bob had some slight peccadilloes, one of which was that when he was tired and the mud deep, he would struggle along until he reached a good water hole, then he would lay down and roll his rider off and trot away. So he served Hannah, with a child behind and a child before. But she did not mind trifles. I'm getting rather ahead of the true narrative. For a year or two after the bear story, we did not have many horses. They would get snagged on the cane stubble. We had some mules. Oxen pulled our wagons. Whenever Collier or myself went from the house, we carried our rifles. If we wanted to have a chase, we went to the back fence, not very far, hissed the dogs, and in a few minutes they were in full chase after a bear, deer, panther, wildcat, catamount, coon, or possum. We did not know which. We would, when we heard them bay, go into them and find them scratching out of a rotten log a possum. We would bring him home and eat him, but he was not the game we wanted. On one occasion, after a long and weary struggle, we found them baying a lot of young buzzards in the butt of a hollow sycamore. Like me, to accomplish anything great, they needed a leader. I went home to Jackson. I was yet a lawyer. After some months, I returned, and I missed one of my mules. I inquired for him. Collier frankly acknowledged. I swapped him to Old Belcher for a bear dog. There he is, Old Lion. Old Lion, at the mention of his name, looked at Collier and seemed to realize that we were talking about him. He looked at me and did not seem to be overjoyed at the change of masters. I replied, if he is a bear dog, all right. In time, we were reconciled. He was half Newfoundland, one half white and the other black. He was a dignified old dog, but being defaced with the mange would scarcely be presentable at a modern dog show. Now, Old Belcher, or Colonel Belcher, as we afterwards prudently called him, was camped, as we thought, on the 16th section, east bank of Deer Creek, where the village of Clatonia now stands, just below Hollandale. He was six feet, three inches tall, straight and raw-boned, about 55 years of age. His front teeth projected forward. As to the past, he was impenetrable, and nobody dared ask him a second question in that direction. He came to see us occasionally and called to me Jack and was very familiar. His first work was to drink all the whiskey he could reach. Then he would tackle the number six, which we kept in quart bottles, close it out, then he was ready to bid us goodbye. Passing Smith, Smith asked him how he liked Mrs. Paxton. With his accustomed politeness, he replied, well, I like her a blank sight better than she likes me. He and Mrs. Hogan were very friendly. She lived opposite Westburg. Belcher would bring her bear meat and show her how to cook it. Mrs. Hogan was a good housewoman. She herself had some experiences with the Comanches in western Texas in early life. Belcher was universally believed to be one of the last of Murrell's men. He was a persistent tease and full of practical jokes. Mrs. Hogan died and was buried opposite Westburg. Now we thought that we had a leader and were equipped for bear hunting. We went into the cane. Lion was true, but every cur would start and run his own game. To remedy this, we cut long trails through the cane on which we would ride a mule. Then Lion would lead out at a slow trot. Behind us came all the other dogs. The order to them was, keep your mouths shut. Occasionally, Lion would throw up his head and sniff the breeze, then trot on. Before long, his nose was on the ground, then high in the air, sniffing to the right and left. Suddenly, he would leave the path and open. Every dog responded. The woods were vocal with the music of the hounds. We dismounted and followed. For a time, we would find the bear on a limb of a tree. But the bear soon learned that the tree was not a safe place for him and would keep to the ground, walk, and fight. When tired, he would back up against a tree. 
Then Lion would sit at a safe distance and bark to call us and stimulate the other dogs. They went in and were killed. At the report of a rifle, every dog charged, and Jim Collier with them, to save his dogs. A quick thrust with the knife behind the shoulder, and the work was done. If we were not far from an opening, we would cut a trail to it, send a man for a mule, harness, and single tree with a hook. Hooked in the jaw, the bear was soon at home. Then we would skin the bear, taking with the hide the great blanket of fat, four inches thick, that enveloped him. More frequently, we half skinned the bear, went to work with our knives, and pitched from one dog to the other until every dog had all he could carry. The bargain between Jim Collier and Lion and Lion's successors in office, Slim, the Elder, and Old Ring, was that you shall never open except on the trail of a bear. You shall never run the back track. You shall never desert the chase. And I will never leave you in the woods. I still lived in Jackson and came and went. Old Slim became the leader of the pack. He was equal to his office, a fit successor to Lion. About a year after, Jim Collier abruptly said, Jack, I will tell you what became of old Lion. I killed him. The bear was backed up against a tree and the dogs were fighting. I crept up, saw the black, and fired. I killed the old lion. I sat down, had a cry, and never mentioned the subject from that time to this. Old Slim served his term, and Collier now installed the elder. He fancied he saw a resemblance between the behavior of his dogs and the discipline of the church. They would quarrel and fight among themselves, but with all outsiders, they stood solid. Jim Collier's favorite puppies slept with him. Don't the fleas trouble you? I inquired. He answered, No, a flea don't quit a dog to bother me. Now Bear, like other gluttons, overestimates the capacity of his stomach. He seizes a big hog, not to kill, but to dine. He likes his meat not only raw, but living, with the flowing blood for sauce. So having seized his hog, he commences eating just at the top of the foreshoulder, the least vital part. He loves to hear his dinner squall. Sometimes Jim Collier would interrupt his noisy feast and the hog would escape. Jim Collier found it difficult to maintain discipline in a pack of bear dogs so often recruited by Joe Woodson with the miscellaneous lot of hours captured in Vicksburg. So one night about ten o'clock, it being intensely dark, we heard the pack furiously fighting a bear in one of the bodies of fresh-cut cane. So we hastily left to save the dogs. The bear traveled slow and guided by the barking of the dogs. We soon caught up. The dogs were all around the bear. We dared not shoot lest we might kill a favorite dog. So clubbing his gun, Jim Collier charged. The blows fell fast, the dog slunk away, the bear said boo boo. Then came the voice of Jim Collier. By blank I've broken Colonel Falls' gun. Colonel Fall being the husband of Aunt Betty after McNutt died. And so he had. A small shotgun borrowed to shoot ducks. The leader of an overworked pack of bear dogs doesn't live long. So the elder retired, and we installed Old Ring, a fine cur. On one occasion, we entered the cane where the store now stands. We often separated. How far we traveled, nobody ever inquired or knew. But guided by the sound of the dogs, and particularly by the voice of Old Ring, we reached the battlefield at the same time. The bear was backed up against a big gum, his rear thoroughly protected. The dogs fought furiously, the trained ones snapping and trying to reach his rear, the new recruits in front. When one of these imprudently got within reach, the arm of the bear, quick as lightning, swung and fell. Death was in its path. We agreed to fire simultaneously, and so we did. Jim Collier charged with his knife, a quick thrust, and the bear was dead. But the sound of the guns, a dog squalled. We looked around. Old Ring was shot through the neck, but not badly hurt. 
Collier apologized to O-Ring, said his ball had glanced on a cane. Next day I went over to see Jim Collier. He said, Jack, you shot O-Ring. I answered, I knew it all the time, but you took it on yourself, and I did not like to dispute your work. But how did you know? He answered, Well, I cut the ball out, and here it is. I put it in one end of the medicine scales, and my ball in the other end, and your ball is the heaviest. You shot old ring. As time progressed, the plantations enlarged, and the bear were crowded back. Now we had yet with us the three Greenlee brothers and their sister Josephine. Two of the brothers, Elisha and Bob, were practicing physicians. They would never refuse to go to see a patient unless they were fishing with Aunt Betty. They never refused to go with her, but would sometimes weary of the sport. About four o'clock in the evening, Aunt Betty would be seated on a log far out in the bogue, intently watching her cork. Bob on the bank would say, Aunt Betty, let us go home. Without looking around, she would say, Hush, Bob, I'm going to get a bite. Elisha, with his tackle all rolled and ready to ride, would say, Come on, Auntie Betty, I'm hungry. Looking in her gourd, she replied, I've got just one more worm. Let me fish him. And she did. The winter of 1856, a regular northern winter, came upon our hunting grounds. During all the month of January, the ground was covered with snow and ice. The cane was flattened to the ground. All the limbs of brittle timber, such as box elder, holly, etc., were dropped on the already prostrate cane. Our vacation was gone. We still hunted for deer in the open woods on horseback with our rifles. The deer were very abundant. We allowed our dogs to chase foxes and cats. A gray fox may be driven up a tree, and the red one never. Our dogs forced a fox up a small tree in the bend. Jim Collier wanted a pet, so he climbed up and took the fox by the back of the neck. The fox twisted his head around and took Jim by the base of the thumb. I stood on the ground and watched. Both were true grit, and it held on until Jim climbed down and I, with my hunting knife, forced the fox to let go his hold. Jim held on to his pet, took him home, and put him in a cage in the yard. Not many days elapsed before we discovered that a fox in a cage was too odoriferous for even Jim Collier. So we turned him loose, gave him 15 minutes start, and put the dogs on his trail. We did not follow, but afterwards left our foxes in the woods. In early time, Hannah had wanted a pet too, so Collier brought her a broken-winged crow. She asked him if the chickens in the coop would hurt the crow. He answered, no. Very soon she found the crow dining on the chickens. Collier was a good plantation doctor a tender nurse, and often helped us with our sick children. Now I have known many persons to be lost in the woods, but I have never known a family so completely lost that a Methodist preacher did not find them. So Marcus Johnson found us. He owned a plantation in Arkansas, west of where Lake Lee now lies, now the bed of the Mississippi. His place overflowed. He wanted a cutoff made. The planters above, with their hands and spades, came down and cut a ditch. The planters from below came with their guns, hands, and shovels and filled it up. The cutoff desired by Johnson was contested by the planters until 1858, when the Mississippi settled the question, and Shirt Tail Bend became, and now is, Lake Lee. We then had a preacher, John A. B. Jones. His headquarters were at Cater's at the mouth of Williams Bio. He would often spend several days with me. We were talking on the gallery at 10 o'clock at night. He said something about bears, and I answered, There is one down there now, eating corn in the field. He said, Let's go in and have prayers. Let Sister Paxton go to bed and go to kill him. We went. I knew the crossings, stationed Jones at one of them, and drove the bear to him. At the report of the gun, I ran to help. Jones said, I've killed him, I've killed him, and he's as big as a cow. 
I inquired where he was, and Jones said, Just in the cane, the cane there. The report of the gun brought the dogs. They brought Jim and Lev Collier and their dogs, and the dogs confirmed Jones's statement that the dead bear was in the cane there, so we entered to get the game. But the game was not yet dead. The bear moved, and we parted the cane before us, and feeling our way, followed. No man deserted the chase. If we had not followed the sound of the dogs, we would have been helplessly lost, for we could not see our hands before our faces. When the sun rose, for once, Sister Paxton was alarmed. She had lost both Jack and the preacher. She mounted Bob Waterman, and with the big horn at her side, walked up the woods from Black Bow to Bogue but Jack and Jones did not hear the horn. They were a mile west of the Downs place, slicing bear and feeding him to the dogs. When God made man, he gave him dominion over the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, and the fishes of the sea. On his face, he wrote his commission to govern the world. The starved wolves in a body may pursue and slay. The cat up a corner will fight in self-defense of her young. But I have yet to see the wild animal that would look me in the face and advance to attack. Aunt Betty died on the 26th of May, 1893, of pneumonia. When I first knew her, she was a member of the Methodist Church and died in that communion. Her house was ever the home of the preacher. She was not demonstrative as a Christian, but ever contributed liberally to the church and all church enterprises. Her ear was ever open to the cry of distress. She visited the sick, whether black or white. She was a fearless rider on horseback and loved the wild woods and a fisherwoman persistent beyond the men of Galilee. She hunted up poor orphan girls, took them to her house, dressed and reared them as ladies. The children loved her, and she, childless, loved children. We will not see her like again. Jim Collier became a justice of the peace. Collier's children inherited part of the old Walnut Hills plantation. To attend these properties, he went to Warren County and settled on the inheritance of his children. The yellow fever came, and when the last child died and the body was taken from the bed, Collier took the place of the child and died without a struggle for life. So lived and died Jim Collier, an honest man, a diamond in the rough of purest water. I am in my 83rd year, have seen generations pass until I can scarcely recognize a contemporary. I lie prostrate and painless on the bed of death. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only name given under heaven whereby man may be saved from his sins. Signed, A.J. Paxton, Sunday, August 28, 1891.